Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, today I did a rather heavy video on the coronavirus. So for Friday's video, I decided to do something a little bit more whimsical. Now, not long ago, Professor Dave Explains put out his 10 challenges for the Flat Earth. And apparently, one of the Flat Earth talk shows tried to answer some of them. And after going through logical fallacy Tourette's, they really failed miserably, not being able to answer a single question out of the 10. Blue Marble Science did an excellent video about this, where he really outlined the fallacies and silliness of their responses. And I would recommend that you have a look at Blue Marble Science and Professor Dave Explains for a little more information on this. But given the fact the Flat Earth failed so miserably on this challenge, I thought that I would help them out a little bit and maybe explain the questions to them in terms that they may be able to understand. So let's cue up the music and get going. It should be fun. Okay, now question number one was very simple. Make a real map. It doesn't have to be this map. This is an AE projection of the globe. All maps are projections of the globe. All maps have some inaccuracies because they're flat objects being projected off a spherical object. Some are good for distances. Some are good for navigational headings. And some simply show the continents more accurately. But all of them are based on a globe. That's why they work, because the Earth is a globe. So if you think that the Earth is flat, give me some dimensions. Give me a model of the flat Earth that you can use to make predictions. Specifically, I would like you to come up with a scale for your flat Earth model, and I want you to measure the distance using that scale between any two points that I designate. And it has to match the actual distance between those two points should be a very simple thing to do. It's just a map. Tell me what the flat earth looks like. Now the next one, very simple. Now we all seem to agree that the sun is somewhere directly over the earth at some point between the Tropic of Capricorn in the south and the Tropic of Cancer in the north. The sun never is over a point on the earth north or south of those two limits. This question is kind of twofold. Number one, I want you to tell me the amount of light and darkness on any point of the earth that I designate on any date that I choose. I can do that with the globe model. Can you do it with your flat earth model that you developed in question number one? It should be a simple thing to do. Just tell me how long the day is going to be on say December 21st in Sydney, Australia. How much daylight will we have and how much nighttime will we have? When will the sun rise? When will the sun set? That's all I want you to be able to come up with. Now, what Professor Dave suggested was this particular city in Tierra de Fuego in southern Chile. People can actually note the time of the sunrise and the sunset on any day. We can go to date and time and figure out when sunrise and sunset will be. So here's a table of the sunrise and sunset of that city in December of 2019. Tierra de Fuego is well south of the Tropic of Capricorn. And we know that the sun, by definition, must be at or north of the Tropic of Capricorn, towards the North Pole. So why don't you go ahead and explain this for me. On December 21st, the sun rose at 4.51 a.m. And the direction of the sunrise was at 135 degrees. Now due east is 90 degrees. 135 degrees is south of 90 degrees. So tell me how that's possible if by definition the sun is north of that location. So why don't you go ahead and pull out your model or your map. Tell me where the sun was on that day. Tell me at, at what point on the earth the sun was directly over on December 21st, 2019 and then tell me why the sunrise appeared to the south of due east on that morning. Now, you also might notice that the sun set at 10.11 p.m., and the sun set at 225 degrees, which is also south 
of due west, which is 270 degrees. So tell me how that happened with the sun being directly over the earth at a location north of this town. Now, number three says, make a prediction, any prediction whatsoever using your model. I want you to tell me when the next full or partial solar eclipse will occur in the Hawaiian Islands in the United States. Now, I can tell you that the next full or partial solar eclipse will occur in the Hawaiian Islands on April 8th, 2024. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what time it will occur? and tell me whether it's going to be a full or a partial solar eclipse, and how you could tell that using your model. Now this next one's one of my personal favorites. You see this building right here? This is the Willis Tower in Chicago. Now the Willis Tower is 1,450 feet high. I want you to find a spot at least 500 miles to the west or the southwest of Chicago Look over that flat prairie land and take a picture of the Willis Tower. In your response to Professor Dave's original video that Blue Marble Science talked about, you started sputtering on some nonsense about the Raleigh criteria and the limits of diffraction. Okay, those are very real things. The limit of diffraction is one minute of angle for the human eye. At 500 miles, one minute of angle for the human eye will be no more than one half the height of the Willis Tower. In other words, the Willis Tower is twice the diffraction limit and should be easily seen at 500 miles. Go ahead and send me a picture of it. Now the next one is one of my personal favorites. Take your P900 or your P1000 and take a video of a boat from the time it leaves port until it docks. Now I'm gonna give you the boat that you can use. This is the SS Badger. It is a car ferry that goes from Ludington, Michigan to Minnewauk, Wisconsin, 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. This ship is 410 feet long and 60 feet wide. Now the distance from Ludington to Wisconsin is 60 miles. You can get up high enough to get past the waves so that they're higher than the waves on Lake Michigan. 20 feet should be more than enough space. But I want you to go to an observer height of 20 feet with your P900 or your P1000. I want you to take a continuous video of the SS Badger as it leaves Ludington until it docks in Wisconsin 60 miles away. The Raleigh criterion for the diffraction limit at 60 miles is 30 feet. The Badger is two to three times higher than that off of the water, so it should be clearly visible all the way over to Wisconsin. Send me a video from the time it leaves until the time it docks on the other side of the lake. Not too much to ask. Now number six, I want you to explain sunrise and sunset. Now this is very similar to number two earlier on, but there are some very specific things I want to know. Again, from Sydney, Australia, and from Tierra del Fuego, on December 21st, 2019, the sun rose to the south of east and it set to the south of west in both locations. I want you to explain how that happens. Then I want you to explain the angular size of the sun between sunrise, noon, and sunset and why it doesn't vary. Then I want you to go up in a balloon or show me a shot from a balloon that goes up extremely high in the atmosphere and show me that the sun is a different angular size than it is from the ground. And finally, tell me where the sun goes when it's dark and why we can't see it. Oh, and a bonus question. Why are clouds lit red from underneath at sunrise and sunset? And why at sunrise is the first thing that receives sunlight the top of buildings or the top of mountains. Now this is one of my personal favorites and something that's always confused me about the flat earth. I, I just don't know how the geometry would work. So why don't you go ahead and explain it to me? We realize that something blocks out the sun during a solar eclipse. According to our model, it's the moon and we can predict it to the day, the minute, and the second as to when it's going to occur. Why don't you go ahead and tell me how that works on a flat earth? Now, here's the problem that you run into. 
if the sun and the moon are the same height above the earth, we could never have a solar eclipse because there would be no time on earth that the moon would be in front of the sun and block our sight of it. If the moon is lower than the sun, there would be a solar eclipse somewhere on earth all the time. So why don't you go ahead and tell me the difference in elevation between the sun and the moon that would allow a solar eclipse to only occur maybe three or four times a year at most. Tell me how that geometry would work. And while you're at it, if you don't think that it's the moon that's blocking out the sun, you think it's another body, can you show me some evidence that that other solid object exists that blocks out the light of the sun. Can you ever show me a solar eclipse that occurs with the moon visible someplace else? Shouldn't be too hard. I'm sure you can figure that out because you guys are just so smart. Now this one is kind of interesting and I thought was a little bit of an unfair question by Professor Dave. He wants you to go on up to the moon or the sun which are local, and bring back a sample. I'm going to make that a little simpler, and I think Dave talked about this briefly, but I want to make sure that this is very clear. I want you to get an angular size of either the moon or the sun from the surface of the earth, and then show me a picture from, say, 100,000 feet that has a different angular size compared to what you would see on the ground. In other words, since you're 100,000 feet closer to the sun or the moon, it should correspondingly appear larger. Show me that that happens. Number nine, using your model of the Earth, plot a flight plan between Sydney, Australia and Santiago, Chile. A flight plan that is actually flyable based on distance and time in the air. It needs to be comparable to what we actually find is the flight time between those two locations. And there is a direct flight between Sydney, Australia and Santiago, Chile. I want you to go ahead and match that on your flat earth map slash model. Now, number 10 is probably the simplest of all. Write a scientific paper about the flat earth and have it published in a reputable peer-reviewed scientific journal. I'll suggest nature. Have something that'll stand up to the editorial staff and won't be shot full of holes by your peer review. Or if that's too hard for you because it involves writing big words, invent something that would only work on a flat earth and would not work on a globe earth. Anything at all. So Flat Earth, this has been a lot of fun to do. I wanna thank Professor Dave and Blue Marble Science for giving me the idea. I hope my explanations were simplistic enough that you could understand them. And I look forward to you rising to the challenge of middle school science. So let's have you go ahead and explain some things that we can witness and measure on our Earth. And then do some things that we certainly could not do on a globe, like track the SS Badger all the way from Ludington to Wisconsin. You should be able to see it the entire distance at 60 miles from 20 feet of elevation. All right, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button down there, or I guess it's down there now, and I'll see you again soon. I really look forward to your answers from the Flat Earth Scholars. Take care.